Hey everyone, thank you for coming back and joining us in this video. We have Derek Williams back with us again for the first time in a good few weeks. We are going to be looking through the writings of Louisa Picaretta and the Divine Will, which is gaining great popularity all over the world. Derek's had some recent trips abroad and he'll maybe fill us in on a little bit of that. And today's teaching directly from him on this video we're going to focus on the rounds. Now, to get more clarification in that, Derek will explain them and then get into a little bit more detail. And I believe this is an answer to some requests that you had in the comments of the previous videos. So here we are giving it to you. And I'd first of all like to welcome Derek back. How are you, Derek? It's great to have you back with us. Thanks, Mark. It's great to be back here. I'm doing okay. Uh, the, the overseas travel left me feeling a bit fatigued. Um, you know, flying by plane is great when you're in your twenties, but when you get to your fifties and so on, it comes a bit tiring. Yeah, well, the grace of God will be your strength, no doubt. A good tiredness for good good work is always a reward. Absolutely, that. absolutely. It's good to be tired from work. That's very good. Excellent. And before we forget as well at the beginning, Derek, you do have your own YouTube channel in the beginnings. We've still to reach that first thousand subscribers for you. So if we can ask everyone to support the channel, especially if you're looking for evangelization and your Catholic faith, as well as the, the teachings of the Divine Will by Derek, head over to his channel from the Pistinia. The link will be in the description box below and we'll remind you again, hopefully towards the end of the video, uh, to check that out. But first, let's crack on with this teaching and see how you like it for yourselves. Over to you, Derek. Let's hear about oh, thanks, the of Divine Will. Just before I launch in, Mark, um, you were talking about my channel and the teachings. I just want to let the listeners know, the, the viewers, that I just started a series of teachings on that channel on the topic of biblical covenant teaching, taking them through the different covenants in the Bible. And anybody who wants it, I can supply them with actually a Bible study workbook on PDF. Now, the reason I'm doing this is because the people who have been working with me with the divine will teachings, they see me constantly going back to sacred scripture to reference what was happening with Louisa and the divine will. And they've been saying, look, can you give us some scripture teachings on your channel? And so I started to put these on video. And then people say, me, can, can we have the workbook? So sending the workbook out. Not vast numbers, but just a few people. Um, but I just wanted to pop that out so people could, knew that even though we're here teaching about the divine will, it's always good to keep laying that foundation of sacred scripture so that you've got a good, solid foundation in which to learn about the divine will. Absolutely. I couldn't agree more with you. And for all the decades that you've been teaching that and evangelizing, you're obviously a great and trusted source of it. So, yes, people, judge for yourself in this video and the few others that we've done. And you, no doubt you'll come to the same conclusion that Derek is definitely a trusted source you can rely on. <laughs> Give him the support, help him grow, reach more souls around the world while we can, and check out his channel in the link below at the end of this video. Amen. Amen. Them, Thanks, Mark. Great yeah. stuff. So... Looking at the rounds of creation, so Louisa presents us with a with a new method of prayer. Um, and don't forget, this actually comes from Jesus, what Jesus is teaching Louisa through her diaries. And for this, um, I'm I'm using also the, the the doctoral thesis written by Father Joseph Inutzi, and he talks about the three types of rounds. Now, when we say rounds, we're talking about the soul journeying around creation. In the use through the use of its imagination, um, to place "I love you" in everything that God has done, we can do rounds of creation, which is obvious for itself. We can do rounds of redemption, where we go through the lives of Jesus and Mary and the, the New Testament, the events of the New Testament, and we can do the rounds of sanctification, which is the work of the Holy Spirit in the life of the Church. Now, let's just take a look at the rounds of creation. When Jesus created the universe and everything in it, um, which he was creating for man, he was creating it for us as our, I feel like, as our playground, as a place where we would abide. Um, 
And as he created everything, he placed I love you in everything he created. Now, we take a very simple example of this. We take a leaf or we take the song of a bird. When you hold that leaf, you can't see it. You can see the leaf, but you can't see what's in the leaf that God has placed there. And But Jesus is telling us now through Louisa's writings that within that leaf, Jesus has placed his I love you. That leaf was created for us to admire, to enjoy, to enjoy the beauty of it, to recognize the love of God in that leaf. The same with the bird song. You hear the bird song at sunrise. That is Jesus proclaiming his love to us. I love you in the bird song. So everything in creation, everything that we're surrounded by, is oozing the love of God. Every, every breath of air, every ray of sun, every drop of rain, it's all Jesus has placed I love you in everything. Now, when God created Adam in the Garden of Eden, Adam in a state of grace, no sin in the world, no death, no destruction, um, Adam could see God's love in the whole of creation, shining out. He could see it because his, he was filled with the divine will. And what Jesus wanted Adam to do was to reciprocate his love. Now, the way, Jesus, the way Louisa explains this is she talks about how when she was bilocating with Jesus, she was bilocating with him through the universe. And he was placing his I love, Jesus was saying, placing his I love you in the sun, in the moon, in the stars, in the planets. He was, he was placing, and Louisa was watching him, and she was full of joy. And then Jesus says to her, you do it. You see me doing it, now you do it. And as she placed her I love you in the same, um, the same objects that Jesus had been doing it, she said Jesus was filled with joy at her reciprocation. And this is what it is. It's a reciprocation of what God has done. God has placed his love in everything in creation. And now he wants us to reciprocate that. So when we go out, when we go, or even in our lounges, in our living rooms, whatever we're doing, we can place I love you in every blade of grass. I love you in every tree. I love you in every plants, in every leaf, in every breath of air, in every cloud, in every star, sun, moon, galaxy, because everything is oozing with God's love. He has placed his love in everything. Um, now, so her father Joseph writes it like this. In Louisa's writings, one discovers that if man sinned and frustrated God's design in the material cosmos, this design is restored through the divine acts of Jesus and Mary. And of those souls that live in his will, who, loving God in creation through the gift of bilocation, Restore the rightful claims of all creation. The soul's acts of going throughout creation to love God as a center of all he made and did for mankind are referred to Louisa as the rounds in creation. And here the soul expresses its love for God by bilocating itself through the operation of the Trinity. Father Joseph writes, the operation ad extra, so the external works of the Trinity. So Louisa reveals how the soul, by making its rounds in creation, restores to God the original order of creation. So when creation, when God created everything, he created it for us to love him in. And since Adam, no one has done that. So uh, apart from Jesus and Mary, when they were on earth. So we were created to love God from the moment of our conception until the end of our life. Uh, because we're not doing that, then the, cl the rightful claims of creation are not being received, as it were. So Louisa explains that. There's a very long paragraph here that I won't go into just yet, but... It's basically journeying. Oh, that's right. He says by locating. 
so he talks about this a bit in, in his in his thesis, and he says how through the use of imagination, how we can bilocate through creation by placing I love you in everything. So in our imagination, we can go to a beach in the Bahamas. In our imagination, we can go to the moon, the Mars, to Saturn, Jupiter, the sun. In our imagination. In our imagination, we can travel around the world and we can place I love you in the oceans, in the fish, in the whales, in the mountains of Japan, anywhere we like, in our imagination. By doing this, we are restoring to God the original order of creation. Okay. Now, that's the rounds of creation. We can also do that for redemption and sanctification. Now, I can keep going on, but I just want to keep touching base with yourself. Yeah, I mean, it's like you can already see the title, the subheadings, and each subheading has so much you can get in depth to, such as this one, the round of creation only, the rounds. Mm. I think I remember saying to you earlier uh, in interviews that sometimes with our part in this, to actually make it divine will, like restoring everything, it's almost so simple we could miss it. Now, you did hmm. go, so when you read things like you're reading there, it needs to take time to digest and understand and break down and things like that. So are you saying just like with that blade of grass, I just say I love you, Lord, and the divine will, and that's that restoration? Is it as simple as that, or am I missing something there? Yeah, because you don't forget you're restoring the rightful claims of creation. So creation... So in, in Romans chapter 8, it's Romans 8, uh, 21, where Paul writes that the whole of creation is groaning in labor pains, awaiting the revelation of the sons of God. Why? Because throughout the whole of creation, since the time of Adam, of, apart from Jesus and Mary, nobody has seen God's love in creation. And therefore, nobody has been able to place their I love you in the blade of grass, in the leaf, in the tree, in the sun, the moon, the stars, in every ray of sunlight. And we have two two types of round. We have the macro and the micro. The macro is Jesus, I place my I love you in the Andromeda galaxy, for example. On the micro level, Jesus, I place my I love you in every molecule of water. That's on the micro level. So the love of God has been placed in all of this, but creation has never had souls who are going to place their love in, in as an act of reciprocation to to say to God, I love with your will, I place my I love you in this blade of grass because God, you have placed your I love you in that blade of grass. And in, in 1 John four, chapter 4, he says, we love because he first loved us. So when we're looking at creation, we can see God's love. God created this for us. When we walk out of the house, everything we look at, God has created for me, for you. He's created it all for us. It hasn't come about by accident. It's all been there for us as an act of love. And what God is looking for is souls who will recognize that and reciprocate it. And yes, do their rounds of creation, going around creation. And what Louisa talks about is how she follows God's divine will in his act of creation. So God spoke, let there be light. So God, I place my I love you in the eternal light, which fills the whole of creation. God says, God creates the, the heavens and the earth. God, I place my I love you in the heavens and the earth. So we're following God's order of creation. So from the heavens, the earth, the light, the creation of the land, the separation of the waters, um, everything that God did, we're following him in that order of creation. So yeah, uh, very simple, but very beautiful. Yeah, when you say macro to micro, uh, so the macro could be looking at the waterfall and putting your I love you, Lord, you know, with the creation of the waterfall, but the micro would be every single drop falling and that there you go. There you go. Now, now once again, let's, let's let's remind the listeners, the viewers, because uh, you might say, hold on, there's a lot of work involved here. People might say, gosh, there's a lot of prayer going on. You've got to remember that prayer is a 
movements of the Holy Spirit in the soul. So we might say to ourselves, gosh, there's a lot to do there. What we need to learn to do is to hear the teaching, which you're doing right now, viewers, and then recognize that the teaching brings its own unique grace, and that grace causes the soul to expand. And what will happen is as you process what you're learning here, you will start to get into the flow of the divine will, and you'll find yourself automatically placing your I love yous in the different, different things. Let's go through the rounds of redemption as an example. Okay. Now, Jesus told St. Faustina, the soul who meditates on my passion for one hour um, receives more grace than a soul who has scourged themselves for a year. So we say, okay, let's meditate on the, uh, on, on the passion. Let's go through the passion step by step. Jesus, with your will, I place my I love you in your agony in the garden. Jesus, with your will, I place my I love you in your agony, your, suffer, your sorrow at the abandonment by all, which is one of his greatest souls. That's from the hours of the passion. Now, what Jesus in the hours of the passion teaches us, the other book written by Louisa, is he teaches about his interior sufferings. So here's what he here's some of the things that he wrote about. And I'll place I love you. I'll do it as a round. Okay? He goes to check on his disciples and he comes back and then something happens. So Jesus, with your will, I place my I love you in your agony as the sins of mankind advanced towards you. So when he checked on his disciples, he came back to pray and he saw all of our sins advancing towards him and pouring over him. Then the hour of the passion then goes inside his sacred heart, which is a unique thing. The church has never known this. And he he reveals to Louisa that um, as the sins of mankind poured down over him, he then suffered instantly, but the soldiers would cause him to suffer gradually. And what he suffered in his sacred heart was he suffered the scourge of fire, the thorns of fire, and the nails of fire in his sacred heart, burning up the sin. So once again, Lord Jesus, with your will, I place my I love you in the thorns of fire. I place my I love you in the scourge of fire. I place my I love you in the nails of fire. What we're doing there is we are we're, we're, we're meditating upon his agonies. We're, we're doing a round. So we're bringing the era of the divine will closer. But we're consoling his heart because we're placing this, I love you, with his own will in his agony, in his sacred heart. And this, this has only just been revealed to the church, this interior life of Christ. It's definitely a, a magnificent way to put it in terms of meditation um, because you're reminding me of two things there. I'm sure people listening to you have got things popping up in their own journeys of life and prayer mm. and meditations and that. The two things that's popping up with me that I can maybe relate, uh, put it into relation, is um, when I was starting to get deeper into the faith, it came about through silent meditation of the the mysteries of the rosary before the blessed sacrament and adoration especially those of the sorrowful mysteries it was very it was a special time of grace looking back all those years ago as a teenager and what began as a 10 15 minutes a few prayers and then leaving became two hours every day i couldn't get enough of it within six weeks but any mystery that i got deeper into it evolved deeper you start th seen clear because you're focusing so hard in the silence with your eyes closed that you're, you're picturing it so clearly that it stays there but then the next week those vim that was so abundant still that the image and the meditation but then the feelings come towards it as well and nothing more than the sorrowful mysteries made the feeling come into it that he did it for me Mm -hmm. the pain and the agony he went through and what can I do to make it better I mean the sorrowful mysteries really did 
make it personal unlike the others, although they were still very clear in my mind as I meditated. And I remember a great priest that I love listening to on YouTube simply put, that if you want to excel in the spiritual life of holiness, you have to give yourself at least 15 minutes per day to proper meditation. It's the only thing to, to make it grow and grow and grow. And that's true because we bring our faculties of the mind and all that into it, don't we? We make it the point where what comes in here can drop into here. This is it. And I like what that priest had to say, you know, um, when people ask me about how much time should I be spending in prayer, I just say, well, personal prayer, an hour a day. Um, and as you say, really good meditation should be at least 15 minutes a day. And this is one of the things that I do when I go to adoration. I just think, right, okay, we'll do the rounds of the, the passion. Let's go through his passion step by step. And like you, when I was younger, um, I think I was about 24, um, I started meditating upon the way of the cross. Um, just as a daily meditation, I didn't intend. I didn't have a firm intention. Oh, I must do it for this reason or that reason. I just started kneeling down and just going step by step through the fourteen or fifteen different stations of the cross. Sometimes the resurrection, sometimes not. Um, and just finding it had a particular impact on the soul. Now I am doing the same thing, but it's expanded. I'm doing the rounds of the passion going from the first moment of the agony in the garden all the way to when he breathes the Holy Spirit on the apostles on Easter Sunday. So step by step, going through it and just placing I love you on each step. Now, Louisa talks about this. She talks about continuing her flow in the divine will as she's doing the rounds. And I think this is an important part of any meditation, any prayer we do, folks, that we must recognize that the Holy Spirit has got us into a flow. And this is important because when we finish prayer, um, we can make a big mistake. We can congratulate ourselves. You know, hey, I, I managed to pray for an hour without being distracted. That That's pride. If you want to go in humility, it's, hey, I didn't pray. I prayed for an hour and I wasn't distracted. Thanks be to God. So direct the glory to God because God is the one. The Holy Spirit is the person of the Trinity who governs our prayer life, our interior life. He's the master of the interior life. That's catechism section on prayer. Therefore, if we do these rounds and we find we're not being distracted, that is the work of the Holy Spirit. Be careful of congratulating yourself on anything you do in the interior life. We must recognize the work of the Holy Spirit when we're doing these these rounds. And it's also worth remembering that the church is in this new era of sanctification now because of you know the, the, the providence of God and Jesus giving us these revelations on, on the different eras, the era of creation, the era of redemption, and now the era of sanctification. Therefore, this era belongs to the Holy Spirit because he's the sanctifier. And the more we are abandoned to the Holy Spirit and flow in this great gift, which is a gift of the Holy Spirit, then the more we're flowing in communion with what God is doing in this in this age. Mark, your thoughts? No, I, I was thinking just little things that come to my mind as well. It is understanding how do we get in the flow. The only thing I would say from personal experience it's not waiting for the the idea that it's going to happen based on what we do. We just have to do the part asked of us and leave the rest up to God. But it's when we look back six months ago, a year ago, further back in time, we might actually see the journey that we've made to this present <laughs> moment. And I've, I've often found that to be, to be true in some way, not as a congratulations, but even just as a sense of, look where I was a year ago. How I was interiorly it could be a anger, agitations, anxiety. It could be not understanding things. It could be anything. But to be with God and do all this and live a life of prayer and consistently with it, then these are where you can look back in time and see, right? So God, because I remember, uh, you probably remember Brother Paul up at the community in Craig Lodge. I always remember him saying years ago, and this man was in his 90s, a holy, holy man. 
He says, if you look back six months, a year ago, and you still feel you're at the same place, something isn't right. You have to keep journeying. You're on the journey. Yeah. It's better you got to keep moving forward. No, the Let only me thing pick I up on something, highlight, if you don't mind, Derek, the only thing I was going to highlight mm-hmm. for myself, actually, and this might be something where, again, if the Holy Spirit's taking charge and he's the master of it all, it comes in his time and, and his way, and maybe sometimes with different people it might be different ways, but it gets to the same point. And I remember a good 10 years ago, I was on silent retreat um, when I was at seminary. We had our annual week silent retreat. And we went to a new place. Um, it was a big convent near a beach. And part of that silent time, I, I started noticing as the days went on, I love sitting down in the water, just let the waves hit off me. And you're looking at all the sand. And then it's the part where I'm only like... 10 centimetres below the water and you scoop up the sand and the little pebbles, little shells, so small. Mm. And, and, and then that silence with no influence of reading materials or preaching from the priests at Mass, even just in that silence alone with God and try to take in the, the awesomeness that even this little grain of sand, this little pebble or broken mm. shell under the water... Why was that created? Mm. Mm-hmm. And and that was 10 years ago, 10 years before I heard of Louisa Pickering. Mm. <laughs> but just the mm. thought that if you spend time in silence, prayerful silence, meditating on the word of God, thinking of God as you're walking along a beach or sitting down at the water there, that something, a thought like that, could come into your own mind. Mm-hmm. And I just sense from what you're saying... That that was the beginning of the journey of actually comprehending the great divine creator. What is the significance mm-hmm. of this unknown little thing under the surface of this water? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. And then you look at all the grains of sand in a beach, and you think of every grain of sand represented one star in the universe. I heard a while ago some t- scientists saying if you had to have a meter by meter box that ran from New York City to Mexico City filled with grains of sand, you would come to about the rough number of what we know of how many stars are in the universe that we're aware of. Oh, wow. How interesting is that? It's beyond like little facts like that. Yeah, yeah. But you put that into the divine creator who took Louisa around the creation of the universe. And then you try and work on, and he did all that for us in this little planet. Uh huh. Uh huh. That's right. That's right. Fascinating. Now let me just pick up on something you said there. You're talking about the interiority, um, and I think this is a vital part of this because often when people, when we approach our spiritual life, we can often very quickly go into the aesthetic life of prayer and do a lot of our own work. Whereas God wants us leaning more towards the mystical life of prayer, where it's the Holy Spirit and his power at work. And in in a, a lot of diary entries, so I'm on December the 8th, 1928. Okay, Feast of the Immaculate Conception, 1928. Jesus says this uh, second or third sentence in, My always lovable Jesus, moving in my interior, told me. Now that phrase, Jesus moving in my interior, is is such a constant theme of Louisa's writings, um, and it's uh, it's where the soul is discerning and noticing the interior movement of God. We talked about the interior movements of the Holy Spirit prompting us, but we might not have. It was probably such a subtle prompt. We didn't realize it was a prompt from the God to do the stations of the cross or to look at the grain of sand, and see the love of God in that tiny grain of sand. And the fact that God had created this sand just so that I could pick it up on this day and admire it. That's That could be the, the fundamental purpose of that grain of sand, to be picked up and loved and see and God's touch on it in that very moment. Yeah, um, And this is the Holy Spirit prompting us interiorly, giving us a moment of grace. And people talk about these moments of grace and I kind of think, why not make it moments of grace? Why not recognize that actually every time I went to prayer, every time I 
sorted it around. Every time I saw something new, this wasn't me. This was the Holy Spirit at work in my faculties revealing to me something new about God's divine action in my life and therefore drawing me deeper inwards towards him, which is where he wants us going, so that we can more easily discern his action, more easily see his movement in the soul. And as we mentioned earlier, the, the meditating upon the passion is a very powerful way of doing this. Louisa shows us that meditating upon the rounds of creation restores the rightful claims of creation to be seen as created by God for a purpose. Now, if you take, if we go the opposite direction, if we go towards the evolutionary theory, it actually strips creation of the rightful claim because it's saying you're here by accident. If we go towards Louisa, it says, no, the, the actual, the correct order is God created the tree, God created the plant, the grass, for a purpose. Firstly, for his eternal glory, but also for us to encounter the love of God in the creation. And therefore, our role in this is fundamental, placing our love in the creation in order to raise creation up to its original purpose. Yeah, I definitely prefer Louisa's take on it. <laughs> <laughs> Who wouldn't, apart from maybe an atheistic evolutionary scientist? <laughs> yeah. Is it not true, though, that even the Big Bang Theory is attributed to a Jesuit priest? Father so George Lemaitre, um, he wrote it around 1927 when Louisa was writing her doctrine on the rounds of creation and so on. And he published it around 1932, 1933. I think those were the years. I hope the listeners will correct me if I'm wrong. Um, interestingly enough, shortly before he, he started writing his theory, Jesus spoke to Louisa and said how much he dislikes priests who study science rather than continuing with their vocation as pastors and shepherds. Um, and you know we have a lot of we have some priests in the church who, to this day, are cosmologists and evolutionists and what have you. And at the moment, they outnumber those who believe in this divine creation and the uh, you know six thousand years since the time of Adam. Um, but clearly, I think a lot of those priests are going to start coming back on board because they're going to see that actually evolution doesn't stand up to scrutiny. It's not good science. And in fact, I was traveling with Father Jim Blount last summer, and he said to me that the number of scientists who are rejecting evolutionary theory is ever on the increase because they're seeing that it just doesn't stand up to scrutiny. All right. So are you saying like the 6,000 years... From Adam to us, it might be lot. It's not. It could be much more. Yeah. No, no, no. Literal six thousand years. So once again, this is the beauty of the doctrine on the divine will. Um, Jesus says it in different ways, but he makes it clear that there were six thousand years from Adam to us. Right. Okay. And he speaks about it sometimes in the context of a Sabbath day. So we're in the seventh millennium of man's existence. Yep. And therefore, this is a time for the human will to rest. So it's a Sabbath rest. He also talks about the first 4,000 years from Adam to the redemption, and then the 2,000 years from the redemption to the era of sanctification. Then he'll talk on another occasion about in the first 2,000 years, he purified the world with water. In the second 2,000-year period, he purified the world by his coming to earth in the incarnation and shedding his blood and letting the light of his divinity shine. He says, now we are at the end of a third 2,000-year period where the earth is preparing for a third renovation, which will be by fire. So water, blood, and fire. And even Peter was talking about this. St. Peter talking about the current heavens and earth are being reserved for fire. They will be consumed by fire. So... We know this is going to happen, right? Yeah, well, as you mentioned that in this channel, it might be a good thing to clear a couple of things up. Um, mm -hmm. Without getting off topic too much, mm -hmm. I did do a bit of a review on this book after the warning to 2030. Oh, my goodness me. Look yeah. at that. 
No, I'm not gonna. It's just when you mention about the first millennium, the second one, you know, the Sabbath and all this in terms mm-hmm. of millennia time period. Mm-hmm. I mean, this book kind of highlights that same idea that we're we are going into a new era, a new age of some mm-hmm. sorts, based on a lot of Marian apparitions and prophecies and things. And um, it, we know with everything coming the way the world is and all prior prophecies and and everything else that's been documented in this channel. As I says to you before, my first impression of listening to you a few times and a couple other videos getting to the idea of what is the divine will all about, the impression I get is this is what Our Lady's preparing us for, that so-called era of peace that she promised at Fatima. In fact, that is the Sabbath, that is the time of rest, the time of peace. A lot's going to happen between now and then, and we're not waiting a very, very long time before it comes. But it seems to be that's how Israel gets humbled, is through disaster, usually of their own making. But if you look through Bible history, you know, disasters, wars, famines, whatever, it purifies. And we can sense there's a great purification coming, and that would be like what goes around comes around without getting mixed up in what the rounds are. But there is something about over time, a yeah. new round. Yeah. There's a new, yeah. there's a new round of battle. We've had a new round of sanctification, and you can sense that it's easy to flip a page on a book or even in the Bible. And before you know it, you've went a couple of hundred years within a page, and we just mm. see the instances. We just see the idea. All right, okay, but when you're living in it, we're living in time of every second of every day, and we can see things emerging in the world as I do. And we are getting into that new era that she asked, uh, she prophesied uh, even back in Garabandal. Mm. You know, we've got timestamps of popes, the four popes after John the 23rd. We see a few other things, the messages of Medjugorje, when Mariana says, Our Lady is planning to renew the face of the earth. And that era of peace, this Sabbath rest, this mm. era of fire. And go back into the fire, a lot of people think, you know, the end of the world that's going to be consumed by fire. But are we talking a literal fire like comets or the sun coming? Or are we talking mm. mystical fire? And that's why I was wanting, that's the tangent coming back to the point. What is the fire? <laughs> okay. The fire is a, a supernatural act of God. So it's not going to be um, caused by nature, which we see at the moment. We see nature uh, kicking back at mankind through wildfires. Um, but it's not going to be that kind of fire. It's not going to be nature in terms of volcanic eruptions. Uh, it's a supernatural um, act of fire which will come from up above and from down below. So if you think about Sodom and Gomorrah, um, that was a supernatural fire which came down from above. Fire rained down from heaven and destroyed the cities. Um Biblical scholars and critics try to explain this away in terms of a volcano or a meteor or something. Um, There is no evidence whatsoever for that. What there is evidence for is that Sodom and Gomorrah's sin had had reached a certain point, a limit, and that limit meant that God now intervenes because the outcry reaches his ears and he strikes Sodom and Gomorrah with, with fire from heaven. And he completely destroys the city and almost everybody, apart from Lot and his wife and his two daughters, they leave the city. We know what happened to Lot's wife. Now, we're in a similar time now where we see sin increasing so much and the outcry is everyone the increase to God to move. As we do our acts and rounds in, in the divine will, that outcry is ever on the increase. Creation itself is crying out to God for the kingdom of the divine will to come. Um, and therefore, God is preparing to move and rain fire down from above, up, from up above. But also, just as with the flood, it says that the flood, it wasn't just rain. It was the fountains of the deep burst forth with, with water. So it came from above and from below. The same thing will happen. The fire will come from underneath and from up above. It will come from both directions. Now, the children of the divine will need not be afraid. Jesus makes it very clear. If a soul is doing the hours of the passion, 
wherever that arrow is being recited, the chastisements will either be mitigated or just won't happen in that place. The arrows of the Passion will protect us. All those children of the Immaculate Heart of Mary, you are a safe refuge. You have nothing to be afraid of. This is key with this time we're in. The weapon that Satan uses against us is fear. And therefore, Jesus tells us, don't be afraid because you have nothing to be afraid of. Jesus is establishing the kingdom in you. Now, in previous eras, we might see great martyrdoms and so on. And, and it, no, when the church was founded, it was founded on the blood of the martyrs. All the apostles martyred. Many of the early bishops, priests, the laity martyred. And the bloodbath was incredible. We're in a different era. Yes, there will still be martyrs. That's, that goes without saying. But Jesus needs children of the divine will to populate, to be here. Because the era of the divine will is upon us. And he wants children of the divine will to be on earth, living in his will, and enjoying that era of peace which he has promised to all humanity. So we cannot be giving in to fear because we hear of a chastisement by fire coming. The chastisement by fire is for those who do not want to live in the era of peace. Yeah. Okay, it's worth bearing that in mind. It's for those who do not want peace. We see people on the earth now, and there's always, they've always been around, people who want sin and people who want war. And then we have people who want peace and people who want virtue. So you have your two groups. And you just have to decide which group you want to belong to. Which Am I, am I a peace-loving, virtuous person? Or do I want war and sin? When you've made your decision and you say, no, I want to be peace and virtue, then that places you in this camp. The chastisement is not for you because you're already being chastised by the grace of God on a daily basis, okay, just to get sin out of your life and to be purified. The chastisement is over here for these ones who want war, who want sin, because they cannot be on the earth when the era of peace comes, because they've chosen, they've made their choice. I want war, I do not want peace. Fine, you can't stay. You're going to have to be purified in the fire. And that's, that's really it, that's really it. You know, I, I sense something just as you put it that way, those who are virtuous and want peace, you're safe. You're the ones that are needed to rebuild the new earth, the new era of peace, mm -hmm. the divine will. And those that are the opposing that, wanting war and everything else. I just sense, did you say that, is that, you know, I am a sinner. I know I've mm -hmm. got my faults and failings, but as you said mm -hmm. those words, I know exactly where I'm fitting. <laughs> <laughs> I, I may not be the most virtuous man I may not be the most holiest man I may neglect prayers from time to time and or something else is going on I forget something, distractions and my, my faults and failures but just as you said that those who want virtue, peace you know, God on that side they're still sinners and I just know as you say that that's where I am that's where I choose to be mm hmm, mm -hmm. That's and the, we are honestly, I really sense that. It's just, I don't know what side I'm on, and I, I mean and, that. And, yeah, and we are, and and we are willing to actually, um, to a degree, to lay down our lives for the coming of the kingdom. For example, here we are now. How many people at the moment would sooner be popping up a bar somewhere in London or in Birmingham or somewhere? And yet we dedicate our time to say, no, we need to promote this. We need to be making the videos, proclaiming the message, getting the news out there, not doing what I want to do, but doing the divine will, doing God's will, and therefore growing in that life of virtue. Whereas there are those who say, oh, what a waste of time. I want to be out there partying, or I want to be out there sinning, or sleeping around, taking the drugs, building the gang, fighting the wars. And you say, okay, but your time is limited. Just bear that in mind. You can go out and do all that, and God is saying to them, God is saying, go, go fight your battles. But your time is limited because it's my time now. The time of man is up. Yeah. It's like this one, one of the things I like about the Lord of the Rings. There's a time where things come to an end. Yeah. The time of the end. 
And this is Tolkien, yeah, a good Catholic who wrote these things in there just to prepare us. You know, this is what's going to happen. The time of the end is upon us, and we now have to make our decisions. And it's like you go back, Jesus said those days would be just like the times of the flood, just like the times of Noah, where people were trading and buying and selling and getting married and being given in marriage, etc., etc. And he says, and then the flood came suddenly. But, but those of us who are listening to the message and those of us who are growing in the divine will, we know that the time is short. We know that we are on a very short leash now, breathtakingly short, breathtakingly. You know, we've had these prophecies over the last few months telling us things are going to happen in October, and look what happens in October. You know, we had we had war breaking out in the Middle East. We've got volcanoes kicking off in Iceland where they've got, uh, they're totally into abortion. They abort every down child that's conceived in the womb. Um, and we have, we've got incidents taken off all over the world now. So it's like, it's, it's, it's happening quicker and quicker and quicker. So what do we do? What do we do, people of God? We do what Isaiah tells us to do. We go into our room and we get on our knees and we start to, to pray more seriously until the wrath has passed. We do the rounds. So from your safety of your lounge or your man cave, your pustinia, you can travel the universe through the use of your faculties and you can love God in everything. You cannot waste time on the inevitable when you're looking at the television and getting all worried and panicky about what's going on and the, the, the world going downhill. Don't worry about that. Focus on the task that God has entrusted to you which is to restore the rightful claims of creation. And if you think about it, just think carefully about this. You have, a, you have a, again, a choice. Do I waste time on gossip and slander? Do I waste time on, on looking for the bad news that's going on around the world? Or am I growing in the grace that God has entrusted to my soul? Because God has made you a steward of grace. And therefore... Should I be actually using this time at night when all is quiet to journey through creation, to journey through redemption, to journey through sanctification, to place my I love you in every Eucharist that ever has been or ever will be, to place my I love you in all of the acts of the Blessed Virgin Mary, to place my I love you in all the acts of Louisa and St. Joseph, to place my I love you in the coming era of peace, this is what we can be using our time for, and and therefore bringing in the era of peace even more. Amen, brother. Amen. And I just want to highlight a few things again that we're discussing, because I know people have got things coming to their That's mind it. as we are in reciprocation of our words. I tell everyone, get your comments in, put what you want, what's coming to you. And then we can build on that because even this video is uh, based on people saying they wanted to hear more about their own. So we do listen to the comments. We do take them on board. And um, this is a good one of it. Now, the one thing that's popping up with me as you keep speaking these great words, Derek, is um, going back to about the fire stuff. I mean, like, like you say, the times that we're in, you're either for mm. God or you're against God. The virtuous wanting peace and love and the divine will, those who are opposed to that. And we know where we are, and time is short. And then the passion of the Lord and the meditations and that. You get back to Garabindal for all the night of screams, what the children witnessed, what was to come, and all these other ones. That you do get knot in the knots in the stomach when you're afraid of listening to things that might be in our time. And I remember receiving them myself often enough if I came across Garabindal or other elaborations of Fatima years afterwards, what Lucia said or what others are suspecting is contained in the secrets, um, and then other ones as well. But the only thing Our Lady said when it came, you like you must live good lives. Right. You know, if when I first when she first arrived, um, the chalice was filling up, and then a few years into the apparition, she says now it's flowing over. Mm -hmm. That was in the sixties. But part of the third secret of Fatima was the angel with the flaming sword as if he was ready to set the world in fire and only by the light of Our Lady stopping it because that great intercessory prayer that our mother's constantly doing. And I've, I read or heard something recently 
she actually got God to give us this great act of mercy of the warning as prophesied. Mm -hmm. well, it Fair, was right. her petition that we have this great gift coming. Now, she says, think about the passion of Jesus when living good lives and to meditate on the passion of Jesus. And it, exactly what Louise is on about and what we we're saying about the meditation and the passion, the wounds and all that stuff. And the St. Bridget of Sweden, when he appeared to her, it was like if you do those prayers he gave her on his passion, by the year of doing it every day, you would have honoured every one of his wounds. And the greatest wound that he revealed to her was the shoulder. Mm -hmm. I'm firing that out there. But he also says, like, look at the times we're in. And Akita Japan, at the very end of all these other events, fire from the sky would fall. So we're seeing yeah. fire again a lot. But I actually received uh, an email a few weeks ago from the son of Mari Loli, the Garabindal visionary who's been watching. Mm -hmm. the and we've had a good chat afterwards as well. We've been in touch and stuff. I met him a few years ago in Garabindal. And I just love this one line that he said to me. The ancient Romans had a saying, motus in fine velocior, if I pronounce that correctly. Movement is faster toward the end. From here forward, from here on forward, things will happen very quickly. So basically, motus in fine velocior, movement is faster towards the end. And I think that's exactly what's going to happen. We're going to see evil going because all the toys are coming out the pram. It's time's limited. It's over mm -hmm. it's very soon. But at the same time, how fast is God going to be working with the time of grace? And this is where we need mm -hmm. to sides and if the divine will's taken off with fire and spreading like wildfire supernaturally speaking if where sin abounds grace abounds all the more this is the time people to pick your side like never before mm -hmm. because i amen. think amen. as well as many others and good sources we're very close to a lot of uh, prophesied things coming and we may be the ones which i believe we could very well be the ones to see so much finally occurring as we've been told about for the past century especially perfect so let's speak on a few things you said there mark first you started talking about the fear um when you were talking about the chastisements and stuff and how it can provoke fear this is something that i get a lot of when we talk about this um and in certain parts of the church fear is a very powerful thing in people's lives what drives out fear Perfect love. Okay. Yep. Now, think about the gift of living in the divine will. When you're placing your I love you in creation, you're saying, Lord, with your will, I love you. I place my I love you in the bird song, in the barking dog, in the cat, in the tree, in the ray of light, in the ray of sunlight. Okay. Um. What you're doing there is you're placing perfect love because you're doing that act in the divine will and therefore with God's own love. You're actually utilizing God's own love and placing God's own love in that particular part of creation. All the time you're doing this, every time you do it, the, the, the power of fear in your soul is weakening and the power of divine love is growing. And therefore, every time you're doing it, you're becoming less a person captivated by fear and more person held by love. And a person who is like that, when these things happen, won't be of impacted. Jesus said, when these things happen, this is in the Bible, I think it's in the book of Matthew, he's talking about the great tribulation. He says, when these things happen, have no fear, hold your heads high, because your liberation is near at hand. Now, we have lived in a world under the dominion of Satan for 6,000 years. That dominion is coming to an end. We're not seeing it increase. We're not seeing Satan grow stronger and extend his dominion. We're seeing him weakening and his dominion weakening. It just looks like it's growing stronger because it's, it's coming out into the light. Um and if you remember from Pope Leo XIII's vision, way back in 1885, I think it was, or were thereabouts. Pope XIII, 1884. Um, uh, 1884. Thank you for the beautiful the correction. October I appreciate 13th, that. 
Yeah, it's October, October 13th. October 13th, 1984. Martin. Absolutely. Feast of St. Edward the Confessor. Yes, thanks for adding that. And yep. That's it. Um, and um, Satan said, more power over those who will give themselves to my service. That's what we're seeing. Okay. Now, always remember, as you see this increase, where sin increases, grace increases. So the grace of God that is available to you now is more than the grace of God that was available a century, two centuries ago, because things are getting worse and things are on the increase in the kingdom of darkness. Guess what? Things are getting better and things are improving and growing in the kingdom of light. We have to remember that. We have to remember that the kingdom of light is always mightier, always stronger than the kingdom of darkness. Mark, you look like you're on your starting blocks there with your book there. <laughs> no, Just seeing your uh, Bible, you? <laughs> this is what casts out all fear, love. And who That's better it. to put it is in the first letter, not the, the gospel, but the first letter of John, chapter 4. Now, the whole chapter, anything of John's great, even on this channel, we're doing the 33 Days to Greater Glory, and it's going through the Gospel of John. Mm -hmm. That takes you into the love of the Father, the way the author explains it. But one of my favourite verses, which I have highlighted, uh, love comes to its perfection in us when we can face the day of judgment fearlessly. Because even in this world, we have become as he is. And love... There is no room for fear, but perfect love drives out fear because fear implies punishment and no one who is afraid has be no one who is afraid has become or has come to perfection in love. And let us love then because he first loved us. Now it's just that fact that to me when I first read that, depending on the in, uh, which version you get of the, the many Bible translations it's the fact that you can face the day of judgment with no fear in your heart because you've came to the fullness of love and that's everything mm -hmm. God the Father that I still sense in a way God the Father is mysterious to us if we don't give him that attention we pray a lot to our lady as Catholics for our intercession and for the graces to come from God through her we know Jesus well enough from the gospels and um, praying to him easily enough they used to say the Holy Spirit was maybe the most neglected of the Trinity, but mm -hmm. I've seen in the last 10 years, seen charismatic renewal, seen a lot of teachings in the Holy Spirit. I wouldn't, I wouldn't say that maybe now, but mm -hmm. I sense all we have is the Our Father. And mm -hmm. that's the whole point of um, the divine will. My will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Now, when you think up the glory up, to God, yes, yes. yeah, I still think the Father is mysterious almost if we don't pick up Jesus in the right way. And John does it so perfectly, but just I will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Compare that to Louisa's writing here, which I showed mm. you. Got finally all 36 volumes in one book. Thy will be done mm. on earth as it is in heaven. Look how deep that can go, <laughs> <laughs> absolutely. A fair few thousand pages. Now, just picking up on what you say here about the Father. Um, in the church's liturgy, so next time you're at Mass, or you're doing your divine office, note the prayers. So when the priest does the collect after the time of repentance and the gloria, the collect, the first prayer before the readings, then there's the prayer after the offertory. There's another prayer done then. And then the, the final concluding prayer at the end of Mass. Generally, those prayers begin Father. So the prayer is often directed to the Father and concludes through Christ our Lord. Amen. And it's the same with the Divine Office. Generally, the prayers are directed at the Father. And it's just worth bearing that in mind. Because we often are praying to Jesus, we're offering praying to Mary, but the church reveals to us that actually we should be praying to the Father. And even in that famous prayer, our Father, Jesus gives us this. Jesus directs everything in his life to the Father. 
John reveals to us in his gospel how Jesus says to the people, um, I say nothing of my own accord. I only say what the Father taught me to say. I do nothing of my own accord. So that's John 5, and in John 8, you've got, I do nothing of my own accord. I only do what I see the Father doing. And in the divine will, one of the um, key factors in the divine will is that the Father is owed glory by every human being. And the only way to fill up the glory that is owed to God by all creatures, by humans, is if we do it, an act in the divine will, and we are filling up the void in the glory owed to the Father. Um, so as you can see, there's a focus on the Father, and I think, I think I can't remember who it was now, but I'm quite certain that it might have been John Paul II who said that this millennium will belong to the Father. So in and and, and I what I like about that is um is in 1999. And in secular world, this was done at the end of 1999. But in the church, it was done at the beginning of the new millennium. Cliff Richard released the millennium prayer. That beautiful, at the Our Father set to Old Lang Syne. And I loved it. I love it. I, I was, had it on Radio Maria last night. And it's just worth noting that that, that was at number one in the UK pop charts in Advent which means it was at the start of the millennium in the church's year, yes. not at the end of the of the previous millennium in the secular world, because the church's year begins the first Sunday of Advent. So Cliff Richard was singing the Our Father to the Father at the beginning of the new millennium, revealing things to us. These things are always revealing things to us, right? Yeah, it's another good way of looking at it. I wouldn't say I've listened too much to him, but when I saw him singing live at Wembley, and it was our father in front of mm. tens, tens of thousands of people, plus millions on TV, I was like, on yourself, Cliff. <laughs> <laughs> well, my wife, when I met my wife, she was a big fan of Cliff Richards, and, uh, and my eldest brother was as well. So he holds a bit of a place in our hearts. And also, um, when I used to travel to Portugal to preach the gospel there, um, one of the places I go, he had a vineyard nearby, and so the local restaurant had pictures of him and sold his wine and stuff. So there's a little beautiful connection with the man there. Who we have to pray for him. He's had a tough time. We have to pray for him. But that's without digressing, Mark. As we keep as we as we're going towards the end of our program, I just want to read this out. So this is where Luisa talks about rounds of creation. Okay, um, and this is how she describes it. I won't read it all out because it's a long paragraph, but I'll, I'll begin it off. So this is from Louisa. And, and she actually says she reveals this to the soul. She reveals it. And we have to learn that. This isn't Louisa teaching the soul. It's revealing to the soul. As that immense void presents itself before my mind, I fuse myself in the, the supreme will and as a little child, I begin my round again. And rising up on high, I desire, desire to requite my God for all the love he offered all creatures at the moment of their creation. I want to honor him as the creator of all things. And so, going around the stars and in each glimmer of light, I impress my I love you and glory to my creator in every atom of sunlight that descends. Again, I impress my I love you and glory throughout the entire expanse of the heavens in the distance from one step to another. I impress my I love you and glory in the warbling of the birds, in the fluttering of their wings. I impress love and glory to my creator in the blade of grass that sprouts from the earth, in the flower that blooms, in the fragrance that ascends. I impress my I love you and glory on the mountain peaks and in the depth of the valleys. So you can see she's going from, from macro to micro, macro to micro. And she's doing this flowing in the power of the Holy Spirit, because this is the sphere of the Holy Spirit, 
and restoring. So she's restoring. We have to remember that. This is not so much a new thing. It is a restoration of that which was given to Adam. So we're in a restoration program rather than something that is uniquely new. Jesus is just revealing to us how things were before the fall happened so that it can be like this again after the chastisement, after the purification. I just kind of picture an idea as you read that and we're out and about and we see every park, every tree, blade of grass, mm. every bird. I mean, you need to be careful it doesn't make a like an obsessive compulsive thing where you're constantly saying it all the time. Or is that what it is? Or can it be the case that when you get into the flow, like you were saying with the Holy mm. Spirit, that it's just the consciousness and the actual sense of love of the Creator that that's the I love you. Well, once again, this is where we we have to look at the teachings of the, of the saints on the interior life. If we if if people say to say to us, "There's too much to do," there is. That's the ascetic life. There's too much to do. My prayer time is this hour, and now I'm getting on with my day. Mm -hmm. If we're moving in the supernatural grace of the contemplative life, if we're truly living in that flow where the Holy Spirit truly is the master of the interior life, then rather than it being an obsessive, compulsive thing, it becomes a river that you're simply being carried along. And you're living, you're having, like, for example, I'll give you an example of this. I was, um, when I was talking to my wife earlier today and she was talking about different things, I could hear this little motion in the back of my mind just saying, come divine will, listen in my listening, breathe in my breathing, think in my thinking. So it's almost like somebody else's voice behind me while I'm listening carefully to what my wife is saying. This is the mystical life of prayer. The Holy Spirit prompting us in our interior life and us being carried in that power of the Holy Spirit. Yeah, that's a good way of putting it. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm taking it in, trying to think, and I'm, I'm hoping that the viewers are as well at this point, uh, because mm. you often he hear people saying, do you not think you're getting a bit too much in with religion? Do you not think you're going a bit too far, too deep? I'm like, well, it's God. How far can you go? What's deep when it comes to the faith? People do this to me as well. You're a very religious man, aren't you? And I say, no, I'm not in the least bit religious. I'm a man of faith. <laughs> There's a difference. The man of religion is into rules and laws. The man of faith is into power and holiness. And I don't see myself as being into so much into rules. When I read things like this and I hear Louisa saying, you know, we need to be doing the rounds of creation, the rounds of redemption, doing the hours of the passion, and doing your prevenient act first thing in the morning, last thing at night. I don't read rule. I don't read law. I don't read um, this is something you have to do. What I read is God's power enabling me to do these things. And when people, say, when I say, oh, you know, I go to adoration and the mass on a daily basis, if I can, you know, people might say, oh my gosh, she's so religious. And I say, no, this is what the Holy Spirit has inspired in me. This is the path. This is the journey the Holy Spirit has guided me on, and I'm going on it. It's like a flow. It's not a. It's not a law to be obeyed. It is a river to swim in. There's a big difference between the two. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. I'd be careful we don't become the Pharisees. <laughs> oh, my goodness. You know, I have it in me, right? And, uh, you know, you said earlier, we're all sinners. I recognize within me easily the capacity to be a Pharisee. Very, very easily. Very easily the capacity to be, the capacity to be a, a scribe, a Sadducee, to walk in law. Um, that, that for me would be simple to flip into. Very, very simple. And I see that capacity in me. Which is why I'm, you know, I'm only, I mean, I went to confession this morning, which is beautiful. But, you know, only only day or two ago, just pleading with God, like I do on a regular basis, 
Um, Lord, preserve me from sin. You're, you're the one who preserves us from sin. You're the one who preserves me from falling into the legalistic rules and regulations. You're the one who keeps us in the freedom of the Holy Spirit. You know, it was for freedom that Christ has set us free. Galatians 5, Galatians 3 or 4 or 5. It was for freedom that Christ has set us free. Please keep me free, Lord, because I don't want, I see the Israelites in the desert wanting Egypt. I want to be in the desert wanting the promised land. Please keep me in that place. Make me a Joshua, not one of those who wants to go back, <laughs> you know. So this is my prayer, you know. It's very simple. Make me a wall breaker. And Joshua. Oh, I love, I, oh that you, you've just said something very, very powerful there. I was actually having some counseling at the weekend because I, you know, I've had a good, I have a good counselor to help me deal with all the childhood rubbish. And then um, one of the things this counselor and I sort of prayed through as the session went on is to break down a wall using this hammer. My goodness, you just said something rather extraordinary. <laughs> I like that. I'm gonna I'm gonna take that into prayer. Joshua breaking down the wall. Yeah. Oh my goodness, that's so pa that's powerful. Wow, good one. <laughs> <laughs> maybe that's what you needed. You've given us plenty, so maybe that's the one thing for you. Is we're I think we're coming towards the end. It's been a good hour or so. Is there anything you want to fill in? Or are you happy to finish off with a, a prayer? Yeah, I just want to say a, a prayer for the for those who are listening, for those who are viewing this. And then, um, Lord, we just place this in your divine will, this whole conversation, we fuse it into your will. And I just pray, Lord Jesus, for those who are watching this right now, who, especially for those who might be feeling overwhelmed at the task that God has entrusted to them. And I just pray for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit into those hearts. I ask you, Holy Spirit, to infuse in them all the graces of the mystical life so that they can see that there is actually nothing for them to do here. The work is all yours. They just need to give their fiat. Lord, do this in me. Fiat, may it be done to me according to your word. And they will abandon themselves to that river, that river of grace, and let the Holy Spirit govern their interior life 24-7, peacefully, lovingly, Gently. So there is nothing to fear. They just go with the flow, moving in the power of the divine will. And Our Lady, Queen of Peace, pray for us. St. Joseph, pray for us. Pray for us. Servants of God, Luisa Picaretta, pray for us. In the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thanks, Mark. Really enjoyed that. Thank you, Derek. <laughs> hope everyone else, I'm sure they have enjoyed it. Please give us the comments below. Check out Derek's channel from the Pustinia. Link is in the description box below. And if you're new to this channel also, hit the thumbs up, subscribe and share. Help us with the algorithm just to reach as many people as possible while we can. And pick your side. We know where we are. And if you're on this <laughs> video and on this channel, I'm pretty sure you're picking the right side too. So until next time, God bless.